Welcome. My name is Teresa Spoonhunter. I'm a Native American and enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho Tribe and a descendant of the Blackfeet Tribe. Dos, Hinanana Niehi Bikina Hisse. The presentation you are about to watch is titled Water, Glaciers, and Conservation on the Wind River Reservation. Our three speakers will discuss water as a precious resource for the economic, cultural, and environmental health of tribal life on the reservation. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Teresa Spoonhunter. I was raised on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation next to Glacier National Park, but I am a rural member of the Northern Arapaho Tribe. My father's side um, are Arapaho, so I've been with CWC for five years, so in a sense I'm kind of also learning as I go about my Arapaho side, um, my Arapaho way of life. But I was raised in a very contemporary family that was very highly educated. They were ranchers, um, but also we were very traditional. We still practice our ceremonies. Um, again, my name, um, Matos Iksapiyaki, translates into um, Holy Beaver Woman, because the beaver is the central bundle for the Blackfeet people. So at age nine, I was given this name. And even though I didn't quite understand the whole bundle system, um, the responsibility, you know, of being a beaver woman, I knew there was some status to my name. And so throughout my life, I grew up wondering, how can I ever live up to that name? I know that name means a lot within my tribe. And so as I got older and learned and went to uh, the beaver ceremony, which is when the waters are high, which is usually June, and then the bundle is put to rest um, for the winter, which is usually in October after the first snow. And so my life was set at age nine, that I was going to be um, someone that my people could rely on, someone that would share, be kind, be generous. And I'll tell you, it's a hard life. Because in the society that we live in, in the Western education system, it totally contradicts, you know, what I'm expected to be as a black girl woman. You know, as Western education, we're told to get an education, become wealthy, you know, get a build your retirement, right? And for me, going to school meant I need to get go into a field that would benefit my people. And so at first, I started out in anthropology, you know, very interested in cultural preservation um, and language preservation. And then I took a federal Indian law class. And I'll believe me, that's the most depressing class <laughs> for any American Indian, you know, and my students, you know. But it's also something that wakes you up. And so from that class that I didn't take until I was I didn't read my tribal treaty until I went to graduate school. The treaty is the foundation of this government-to-government -government relationship. Tribes hold 25% of the U.S.'s oil and gas on tribal lands. We're a big stakeholder. Water is very critical, not only to tribes, but to this nation. And what, believe me, water is bigger. Water is bigger than any casinos, any gaming, oil and gas. You know, I shared a story earlier where I lived in the desert going to school for my master's and doctorate. And, you know, it's a major resource there. And for me being raised as black feet, you pay attention to the bigger picture, what's going on. And I was, 
you know, it's like, how is this the desert? And then you drive 10 miles and there's a golf course. But that does not make sense to me. You know, if we're worried about water, why is there a golf course in the middle of the desert? And so, you know, I paid attention, um, you know, but in the back of my mind, you know, although I was getting a doctor's degree, I could compete with any academic in my field. I also had a responsibility to my child. And that role, like I said, guides me, you know, brought me back to the reservation, brought me back to um, Central Wyoming College. Um, and one of the reasons I chose Central was because it was next to reservation, you know, and I could live on the reservation and still work, you know, in higher education. And so for me to be able to share knowledge, because it's a black book, knowledge is attained through the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation to generation. And a lot of times, you know, in Western education, we're told to afford knowledge. You know, to be the professional, so they have to pay you for your knowledge. But I always knew that whatever I learned, you know, whatever I found out in my education, somehow I'd have to translate it, interpret it for my people that may not have had the opportunity to take the depressant for going to law class. <laughs> so when I wrote my dissertation, I proposed to my committee, I said, well, I need to write something that not all my people even graduated high school. You know, we shared at the last event, some of our old men, our elders, went to fifth, seventh, eighth grade. So what I needed to write was something that someone in middle school could understand. And of course, in academia, I had a couple of professors say, no, nope, you can't do that. And I said, well, then they don't need me on my <laughs> and I found someone that would work with me, and I was eventually able to write something to help my tribe camp in Glacier National Park for the first time in 2009 in over 100 years as a confederacy. And that was asserting their rights on land that was ceded, asserting those treaty reserve rights. Water is a reserve right. So this map that we have is the 1863 Shoshone Treaty Lands, which you, you know, we all know, this is Jackson area. So, and that's the current, you know, um, Wind River Indian Reservation. So I just kind of wanted to give a little pers perspective because of course, you know, when I'm driving through Arizona, you know, I came up to the interstate, cut across, and I'm like, how did they lose Jackson? You know, <laughs> I wanted to know, you know? And so, you know, I looked up this map and I was like, well, okay. So, <clears throat> when we have our ceremonies, we call upon the water, the water beings, the sky people, the animals of the land, the plants, the rocks, so forth, with the humans being the last to be called upon. Until all have arrived and taken their place in the lodge, without the environment and its beings, we could not have this ceremony. And so I shared this opening ceremony at the Harvard Think Tank when Obama became president. And we had many different federal agencies there. And the feedback that we got was from lawyers, from scientists, you know, from watershed managers, National Park Service, BLM, Fair of Rec. And it was like, wow. I never really thought about how my work impacts these beings. Whereas I was always put, you know, my human nature first. And so with that, you know, I kind of want to set the tone for our presenters that <clears throat> they'll each present, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, and then at the end, we'll ask questions. You can direct your questions, you know, specifically to one of the presenters. Our, you know, if it's a general question, you know, I'll call upon someone that may best be able to answer. Um, we do have other people 
um, here in the audience that um, from CWC that would be, um, I don't, you know, at a request if there's an answer that um, we can uh, answer. So our first presenter is Mitch Cotner, who is the tribal water engineer for nine years. He also worked in the oil and gas mineral industry for over 30 years. So in a sense, he worked on both sides of water issues. And so there's no one, you know, um, that, you know, is more fitting to kind of discuss and set the tone, you know, for water issues, water issues facing the Wind River people, the Shoshone and the Arapaho. So with that, my question for Mitch is, what are the current issues the tribes face with their water? And what are the priority uses for the Wind River Indian Reservation? Thank you, Trissa, and I'd like to thank you for attending tonight's program. Uh, as she said, my name is Mitch Cottonor. I'm a uh, enrolled member of the Eastern Shoshone Tribe. I'm also of Cowlitz uh, Indian descent from the state of Washington. <clears throat> I'm a product of uh, the Indian boarding school uh, system. My mother was sent to uh, Indian boarding school in Salem, Oregon, uh, when she was eight years old. And uh, she met my dad there. Uh, they married when they were just out of high school and relocated to uh, the Wind River. Um, I am uh, was born and raised in Riverton. Um, lived all my life in the Riverton and Wind River Indian Reservation. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Utah with a degree in mining engineering. I uh, spent the first part of my life uh, working in the oil and gas industry and minerals extraction industry. I worked for uh, probably 20 years as a, a private uh, business owner and operator. Uh, since then, about uh, 12 years ago, I became involved with uh, water issues on the Wind River Indian Reservation. I was appointed to uh, the Wind River Water Resource Control Board by the Eastern Shoshone Business Council. And, and since that time, I worked on water issues on the reservation. Uh, nine years ago, I became the uh, tribal water engineer and I operated staff on the reservation that uh, our, our duty is to uh, manage and administrate uh, the water rights on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Um, just a little more background. Uh, I was appointed to the Wyoming Indian Affairs Council by, uh, by Governor Geringer when he was governor of the state of Wyoming. And then I served for eight years on the Wyoming Water Development Commission. I was appointed to that position by uh, Governor Friedenthal. Um, to answer the question, first have, what is the biggest concern on the reservation with regards to water is to have an adequate supply to uh, satisfy the needs on the reservation. We have 15 beneficial uses of water on the reservation that were identified in the water code. Uh, the Shoshone and Arapahoe's water code was uh, put together in 1991 as a result of the uh, Bighorn adjudication. Uh, as I said, according to that water code, we're in charge of, of uh, administering the water rights on the reservation. Um, probably our biggest concern right now about the adequate supply is the lack of storage. Uh, as you know, um, our growing season and irrigation season on the Wind River is uh, from May to October. And uh, years ago, when we had adequate snowpack, the runoff occurred at the same time as the growing season. 
But uh, whether you agree to it or not, uh, due to global warming, our uh, runoff occurs early. Most of our runoff is already in Boise and Lake by the time it's time for us to utilize them. Therefore, storage is our only solution. We're working with the Wyoming Water Development Commission right now uh, to the site storage uh, sites, on, one on the big wind side and one on the little wind side. Um, that adequate, that, that additional storage will, will give us the, the amount of water that's going to be able to um, satisfy these 15 uh, beneficial uses of water on the Wind River Reservation. All those uses are interconnected <coughs> and they're based on adequate supply. Um, we have the uh, Tribal Water Engineer's Office and my board, the Wind River Water Resource Control Board. We've been working closely with uh, uh, Senator Barrasso's office and working to obtain water uh, funding to uh, rehab the irrigation system on the, Indian, on the Wind River Indian Reservation. The Wind River Indian Reservation is one of 16 Indian irrigation systems in the West that are owned and operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, when we started working, there was about $1,600 million in deferred uh, maintenance on those 16 irrigation projects. The Wind River is about $90 million. Uh, since 2012, we're working with the Wyoming Water Development Commission, we've been able to do about $11 million in rehabilitation on the system. By doing air rehabilitation, we hope to increase the efficiency of the irrigation system, which would improve the supply of water for each one of those uses. Um, a lot of the things that we've been doing on the rehab have uh, drastically increased the efficiency of the diversion structures, which in essence allows us to dry up the stream if we wanted to, whereas the old uh, structures, they were in such bad repair that uh, enough seepage would go through to take care of, of things downstream. So what we've done is uh, we've started to uh, incorporate fish passage into our structures. It allows uh, <coughs> aquatic species to go up and down the stream as it can. Um, we've uh, put in fish fish screens. This is the fish screen on the Ray Canal. It's the largest fish screen in the state of Wyoming. Uh, we partnered with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Trout Unlimited, and other partners to do this. Our other structures are, you can see this is one of the fish ladders. Uh, prior to the installation of the fish ladders, there were these barriers on the river where fish couldn't migrate up and down the stream. This is the, we have identical structures on the uh, Ray Canal and Coolidge Canal system. This is a uh, fish ladder on the sub-agency canal. That's for sauger. Sauger aren't jumping fish. They, they need a different system that's a steady incline. So that's what we have here. Um, This is the, the fish ladder on the other side of some agency. Um, we have uh, future, we're looking at future fish passage throughout the reservation uh, because, uh, like I say, we utilize the fish ladders to bypass enough water to ensure that there's enough water for domestic use. There's enough water for cultural use. 
There's enough water for religious use. Domestic water is an important thing. In the Ethidy area, many times and towards the end of the year, they are dependent on surface water for their drinking water. And it's not uncommon for them to have a, a boiling order put into effect on them. That doesn't occur in too many places in the state of Wyoming. So we're using our fish ladders to ensure that there's adequate supply of water throughout the reservation for, for all of our people. Um, as I say, uh, storage is our one solution that we're looking at. The, winter, the, the little wind side of the big wind, like I was telling you, has a growing season from May to October. But it's not uncommon for a systematic drought to occur by the 4th of July. Can you imagine your ranchers and farmers having adequate water for their irrigation for, for only probably one third of their growing season? Uh, hopefully we can alleviate that. Um, uh, like I say, all of our water beneficial water uses on the reservation are connected. If you don't have enough supply for one, you don't have enough supply for any. Because none of them are held of priority over the other. Irrigation is held in equal weight as cultural use, domestic use. And uh, we're hoping through storage and through improved um, rehabilitation of our irrigation system that we can be able to provide adequate water supply for our tribal members and also the members of uh, our irrigation project, which includes uh, tribal and non-tribal people. I'd like to introduce Jackie Clancher, who is a professional professor on environmental health, ice researcher on glacial melt, and many, many other projects. <laughs> Her and I are a team on the current export project of microbiomes across the state of Wyoming. Um, so I'm delighted to um, invite Jackie to speak on her partnerships within the Indian Reservation and how her research um, can build partnerships and that sharing of knowledge. You know, we're all facing, you know, water quality, quantity, um, global uh, warming, and so for the first time, you know, this conversation happened, and today we even said Jackie's volunteered to come out and present, you know, specifically to the water board to begin to have those conversations, just like we are having here today. So, thank you, Teresa, and thank you for having me. Yes, I'm honored to be here this evening. Uh, I am not from the Wind River Indian Reservation, and uh, through my communications with Teresa and Mitch and Gabe and various avenues from the classroom to be colleagues to to sharing a vested interest in natural water or in natural resources and water. I've been invited this evening and I'm delighted to be here. As this image reflects, I am involved in water research, not always in flowing water, although that is part of the world I encompass. Um, I've been in Central Army College for the past decade, always teaching a variety of science courses, but uh, although the course themselves have changed over time, there's one content piece that I never lose, and that's water quality and water quantity, and its role historically and contemporarily, and how we're looking to manage that in the future in a changing world. Whenever I look at water, I could say, absolutely, it takes a village. So if Teresa brought me in with the question of, what work am I doing around the Wind River Indian Reservation and how do partnerships play a role? Every move I make, every person with whom I communicate, every student I recruit, every uh, communication to seek funding or to seek permission to travel, whether that's US Forest Service permission to travel or, or even going back historically, the support of the tribes in traveling in terrain that was historically Shoshone terrain, um, 
to feel good about the work that I'm doing requires communications. And if you look at where roughly I work on the Dinwiddie and the Gannett Cirques, uh, along the spine of the Continental Divide in the Wind River Range, this is a no joke location. We are where it all begins along the Continental Divide of the Wind River Range. And the waters that we assess through glacial ice examination or surface water flow into the Missouri, the upper Colorado, the Pacific Northwest. And this isn't this <coughs> water. This water belongs to the Wind River Indian Reservation. It belongs to the nation. As a watershed state, I think you have responsibility to take care of resources. And it's nothing that any individual themselves can conquer. As Teresa was mentioning, uh, a lot of our attention is dedicated to the Dimity Cirque itself. The Dimity is the fourth largest glacier in the wind, a very, very key. If you talk to the BLM, and you heard it here from Teresa as well, in respect to providing water for the Wind River Indian Reservation and Fremont County below and the basin below, it's integral. A massive frozen water reservoir that we are losing before our eyes. So while I'm not from the Wind River Indian Reservation, I have good friends and colleagues who are interested in what I'm doing. And if you look where we're positioned, right in there, it becomes pretty obvious. Water flows downhill, where you see the Wind River Range. Oops, see. Oh, now I've done it. <laughs> Still more clever with the laser. The Continental Divide, water flowing west, water flowing east, the water that we study in the heart of the Dimwitty flows directly downhill and is the water that Teresa's is talking about that's not just for drinking, but for cultural purposes and shaping the destiny of the, of the people to come. What's the status of the glaciers and the winds? The same status of most of the glaciers in North America. They are going. There's no arguing about whether they are going. We never had a hypothesis of, oh, I wonder if they're growing or shrinking. Glaciologists can look at the fern line on the Dimity Cirque and on the Gannet, and each year, we, we can measure it quantitatively, and we do, but we can see the fern line changing. And because so much of what I do is focused on education and educational partnerships, I certainly engage my students in quantitative monitoring and assessment of the glacier, but some of it can be seen with the eye. I wouldn't say for fun, but out of intrigue, if we look here and we look here, you do not have to be a glaciologist or an expert. You just have to be able to see. That's a massive difference. And even if you uh, uh, accommodate for time of year, et cetera, you, you can't attribute that to a yearly snowpack difference. This is a massive and monumental difference over time. And in each one of these glaciers, this is just one, the Dinwoody, the Dinwoody, the Gannet, the Grasshopper, the Sourdough, there are frozen wet reservoir banks. It's like having a savings account. You can have the money all at once and buy all the candy you want, or you can have it in the bank and get the trickle effect. And that's what we're doing and have been doing historically with glacial water is getting the trickle. But the question now is well, what happens when they're gone? There's no more trickle. If you spend the savings in a crisis, what do you have for the next crisis? So you have a problem like this, you rally the team. You want partnerships? Partnerships are built on people. They're built on relationships I build in the classroom with my students. They're built on relationships with colleagues. They're built on uh, colleagues and professionals who have an interest in water and natural resources. So at CWC, I am shameless. I will woo and lure and try any student from any department, whether it's outdoor education and leadership, you guys want to go on the glacier? Or whether it's hydrology, hey, you want to get a job in water? You need to be with me. Whether it's my archaeology, anthropology, and geospatial science students saying, hey, I know you're interested in this, but can I twist your interest to bring you in the mountains for a little something different? And you gather the village. So the sky may not be falling, but the ice is melting. This tarn gets bigger every year at the toe of the Dinwiddie. For now, it's creating almost its own momentary storage, the tarn at the end of the, of the Dinwiddie uh, glacier itself. But as temperatures rise in the alpine, 
as runoff happens earlier, as we lose the reservoir that feeds it, in time, this too might be empty. And if we recall the first map, this surface water isn't flowing to nowhere. It's flowing into people's homes. It's flowing into people's showers. It's flowing into people's cultural beliefs. It's flowing into their bathtubs. It's flowing into their mouths. It's what keeps us alive. From a more hydrological perspective, if we look at it nuts and bolts, Dinwiddie Creek, flowing into the Wind River, flowing into the Bighorn. You heard Teresa mention Bighorn River and our Bighorn water rights. And we know historically, there's a big battle that's been waged over water because water's life. So who do we partner with in this world? Anybody with an interest in what we're doing who'll support our students, who'll support the meaning behind the work, who'll support getting our students in the field. And I, I think every level of partnering on a project like this is critical. I certainly want to give a nod to two groups um, Wyoming Injury, EPSCOR Wyoming, that show up on the left because they're both funded by National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation. And money's not everything, we know that, but it brings together people in a playing field sometimes. If you have the resources, Teresa and I can partner EPSCOR and Injury projects from National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation because we have a pool of funds that we're sharing and we're looking out across our student horizon and those partnerships and going, how can we bring as many people as possible into this mix? And how can we encourage them to invest in the work that we're interested in? That's stipends, student internships, scholarships. Um, we work with some other partners that might not be obvious. I cut my teeth in risk mitigation and wilderness travel at the National Outdoor Leadership School. And to this day, they support our students in the field with gear. And uh, I know where to look when I need some trained mountaineers to supplement our team. So we have a solid CWC team that comes from Knowles, but we bring those folks in as well. And in the future are looking at another research project in East Africa, where uh, I'm currently hoping to move game to in January. The Forest Service, this is a wilderness area, no motorized, no mechanized, fully permitted. I hustle for that permit each year and I covet it, but I also keep in mind the people who were there before. This is the U.S. Forest Service land now, and that's to whom I, I maintain compliance with my permit, but I know there were people there much, much earlier than just the Forest Service in my team. NASA Space Grant Consortium uh, is a big supporter of student education projects and internships, and I guess at the heart of it all are, are the relationships we forge with our students does take a village. I work for a college, an educational institution. It means nothing if my students aren't on board and engaged and fired up about what we do. And of course, we're interested in both in the water quantity, to which Mitch referred, and the water quality. How much is there and is it good to drink? In the realm of quantifying, we look at both glacial depth and glacial area. Geophysics, although intuitively we could look at the glacier and boy, go, boy, this thing's shrinking. Um, it's not enough for students you're training to be scientists uh, and publish papers. They need to go further than that, in, in at least in the, in the realm that I swing. So they work with ground penetrating radar. They do GPS perimeter mapping. Um, we tried a new project a couple of years ago in kite aerial photography. It was a total bust. <laughs> it is never windy on the Dinwiddie when you need it to be windy. And it is too windy when you want a little bit of wind. Does it matter if you're forging partnerships with students to teach them meaning behind geospatial techniques? Not necessarily. All the data we get is not always fantastic, but some of it is. Some of it is publishable at this point. Um, we look at black carbon, how much particulate matter is on the glacier, and what does that do to influence how quickly uh, ice melts each year. And in the realm of uh, E. coli and water quality, actually looking at us to some degree. We're in the Dinwiddie. Are we practicing appropriate waste management and doing our part, not just to collect data to contribute to the scientific field, but to leave no trace and uh, leave the area as good as we found it? And happily, we can say, maybe to my students' chagrin somewhat, we have never uh, been able to get a positive sample of water. Uh, the headwaters of the Dinwiddie is currently very, very solid. We do macroinvertebrate work as well, and we are very pleased with the water quality there. And I suppose my students, I say to their chagrin, because well, who wants negative results every year? But I kind of do. Um, so we got 
cut out a little bit, but crossing the divide between cultures, between managing a resource, between leading the classroom and engaging students, it takes a village and it takes teamwork. And uh, I'm honored to be part of this team in approaching water management issues that uh, affect the nation and more specifically, close to home, the Wind River Indian Reservation. So thank you. So our next speaker happens to be my brother. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle's son, Dave Swinhunter. He is a student, he was a State of BC student. He, we drag him back in probably every semester we can. Um, hopefully he'll get that degree. But he started out in outdoor leadership that has taken him across the U.S. Um, he's served the, at the AmeriCorps Vista and is currently working for Ancestral Lands. Um, he's created a team um, that has worked not only in the Southwest, but he's now kind of heading that team and creating other teams um, throughout Montana, um, Wyoming, uh, to bring tribal youth, not necessarily youth, because we do have some older college age, you know, um, students, um, and bring them out into traditional lands, ancestral lands. Um, one of the things that, you know, in this partnership was when I remember meeting with the Lewis and Clark Forest Service, and you guys probably have seen Badger to Medicine in the news lately, but I served on the Badger to Medicine um, Committee and at one point, the tribe was so frustrated with the management of Badger to Medicine. They said, why don't you just let us take care of the trails? Because that's our traditional land. We hunt, we gather plants for food and medicines. We want to make sure that the wildlife, you know, can stay in this area, you know, with no um, more roads built in, motorized vehicles, contaminating the environment. And so I'm happy to say that Gabe's crew goes in and does the work that one tribe had asked for. Gabe's crew. Well, hey, you know, hey, you know, no, 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 that law has nah, sit no. Um, I'm Northern Arapaho and I'm going to go to the uh, River Indian Reservation and Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Uh, my Indian name is Red Thunder, and here in Grand Teton National Park, they actually call me Red Thunder. In the Conservation Corps, they call me Red, Th Red Thunder. Uh, and it's really awesome that I get to use that name in a lot of the work that I do in working with a lot of different youth and everything, because that really solidifies us and our culture within the outdoors. And with that uh, being said, uh, I also started out in Grand Teton as an ancestral lands intern on the Grand Teton National Park, Park. And my boss and my supervisor are currently in the room from that, <laughs> service, from that intern. And that's Megan Colby and Neely Jimenez in the back of the room, right over there. <laughs> uh, and, um, um, it was an honor to work with them. Um, they gave me a lot of different opportunities in working with various different parts of the park. Art and um, doing a lot of that was very eye-opening, and, and um, um, it just all kind of started with uh, me just asking my NOLS instructor. I went on a NOLS course. I asked my NOLS instructor, "How can I get paid to be in the outdoors?" <laughs> and pretty much that's how this all came to be. <laughs> and sometimes I don't like my job because I have to go to PC and, and talk to. Politicians, <laughs> it's not that fun, <laughs> but I love to travel, so it's a great opportunity. Uh, and um, the thing is, though, with that too, is like we really advocate for our Native American programs and Bureau of Affairs, as the national with the National Park Service, uh, and so on and so forth. Talking about just reporting back what it is that we do. Uh, we do a lot, of, a large range of work, uh, working with youth. A lot of our youth who go through our program. Um, and also thanks again to Megan and Millie because they have, they head up a lot of our, our Grand Teton crews that actually, our Grand Teton youth crews that come 
um, in here, and I don't really have to worry about anything. I could just kind of like come in, check in, and then just leave. I don't really do much. <laughs> I don't really just do a couple of demonstrations as a traditional, uh, talking the language with our youth, and then also just doing other traditional well, games and other things like that. Uh, and that's where it comes in, where the Ancestral Lands program comes in. Um, and with the training that I got with the Ancestral Lands and this program, it is revitalizing our culture, but also revitalizing and what our our impact and our traditional knowledge that we use in the outdoors or as before contact. This is actually yellow in Yellowstone. We do a lot of um, traditional. We re remove invasive species that, is, um, um, that are detrimental to the environment and, and um, that are not originally there. And who better to know what is invasive than not than the people who've been here the longest. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and then um, the other thing is too, we get to collect native plant species that we use in um, both traditionally in our medicinal uses, but then also to be re reintegrate them um, into areas where somebody probably put in a road or something. Uh, and then we take that road out and then pr pretty much put a new, uh, put those same native plants back into that area. Uh, and then we also clear off Social tra social trails, just like a regular trail crew, I'm um, doing a lot of different work like that. Oh, did the same thing. <laughs> the other thing is too is we do a lot of um, um, different kind of uh, of um, fields reduction and also just clearing out trails, just like a regular uh, conservation for. Uh, but then the other thing is too is we actually take some of these trees and replant them in other locations as I really need them. Um, so in that sense, as it's a lot of, instead of us always just going through and killing trees, I guess we're just relocating them um, to another location uh, where they can thrive and everything. And, and even some of these trees, that is, um, like the pine needle and so on and so forth, or um, blue spruce, there was so many trees actually we use as, uh, for traditional medicines and uh, some things I'll get the sniffles away. And then we used to do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, um, one of the major things that I really love to do though, is with our ancestral lands is take them to historic sites. Uh, it's like the Battle of Little Bighorn or um, places uh, as to where there's a lot of stories that really connect us with our people from long ago. Uh, um, that is actually on one of the Great Lakes uh, it's to the Northern Arapaho people. Uh, uh, so we all got to kayak, uh, kayak out there, and, and um, you know, with that, uh, there's like stories and everything that we have elders tell, tell them about uh, what has happened there and so on and so forth, just about a lot of the uh, traditional knowledge that is passed down um, um, and the stories of an area of why that place is called this or that, so on and so forth. Uh, and then with the, and then of course, my crew has to be my crew. This is my first, uh, my first adult crew, uh, uh, and the, the guy that actually climbs up on the tree and puts up a number one to make sure that everybody knows that that's my first crew. Uh, and really, it's really, it's something I'm really proud of. Uh, three years ago, I really worked really hard, hard to get these conservation core crews uh, as far as native youth because looking at the ancestral lands program down in Southwest Conservation Corps where I received my training. Them working with their language, them having their youth going out uh, and doing a lot of the traditional knowledge, uh, that is really what inspired me to do this for our people up here. Yeah, and it was really great uh, to know that people down south were doing that and then and pretty much I just stole a model and came up here and started doing work. <laughs> so, yeah. And then the other thing is too, is just um, um, another thing, significant thing about the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn site I, is that I can actually trace both of my ancestry on my, uh, I can trace the Spoon Hunters I was back to Crazy Horses Ledger. I can even trace I was, my mom's side. I am a descendant of Chief Red Cloud. Um, uh, so in that sense, uh, knowing that both of my families were here at one point in time is really powerful and meaningful for me. And then the other thing is too, is that there was actually a warrior who died there by the name of Red Thunder as well too. So, so that just kind of like gives all these kind of emotions. <laughs> and then a lot of the work that I really have to do, 
uh, is really talk with, um, uh, talk, show people our traditional game, show people, uh, show the people oh, a lot of, um, uh, show a lot of non-natives of the importance of what are the things that we do so, uh, that I can actually teach. There's some things that I can't teach and there's some things I can't talk about, uh, but in that sense, um, the things I can, I uh, share that information with them. Um, and they all get a kick out of it and they all turn around and really find out why it is that we, we have our certain protocols, our certain rules. Uh, so sometimes they get upset by it too, but either way, it is that knowledge that's being passed on and shared there, just like my sister was saying, we have to share that kind of knowledge as you talk about, talk about things. And then, of course, I, and I have to give downtime to my crews, so having them do their traditional, uh, traditional crafts, uh, so having them do dream catchers, beadwork, or um, kind of like what I'm wearing right now, uh, I, keeping those things alive I, with our traditional uh, ways is really something very powerful that we have to uh, we have to maintain. That's me up there doing a traditional weaponry class, uh, <coughs> using atlatls, rampons, bows, spears, just a lot of the things of how we used to hunt before we had guns and all the other stuff, and talking about hunting with our young men and a lot of other things things with that as well. Uh, and then over here, talking about the importance of our animals. Uh, so how we how we utilize them from their hides and their their um, antlers and their bones um, to make our regalia, to make our our gears of war for a long time ago, uh, and then also uh, making um, also making our clothing and uh, then our drums and so on and so forth. But more of that traditional knowledge that is just passed passed down, um, and pretty much that's pretty much my entire story. And so this is just the opportunity to share our perspective. Um, like I said, it's ongoing. We still have a lot of concerns with water, but really to show that, you know, water is transgenerational, important, not only to us, but, you know, we're also respective of our surrounding communities. Because as Native people, we are not, we can't be greedy when it comes to resources. We can't be stingy when it comes to water. And I kind of proposed this, you know, to someone at one point, you know, just as an example, if the shoe was on the, on the other foot, and before I say that, I want to share, um, someone came up to me in the last session and they like, don't tell my name, but I was a federal judge for the Bighorn case. And I felt like I didn't know enough about American Indian water rights. And so I called my predecessor, and he said, the Indians own all the water, and then you'll be able to do your job.